Well, I just got uh, some great news. My 1977-78 Chevy pickup is insured. You ever heard that Johnny Cash song, babe, where he says, oh, hey, yeah, you better have heard this. It's a 58, 57, 56, 56. Yeah, you sing it all the time. 67, 68, 79, myself. automobile. Hi, yo. They had to figure out if they Hello. could actually insure this. Because it was literally piecing it together. Is it a 77? Is it a 78? What is it? But lo and behold, State Farm did it. I don't think Geico could do that. Oh, I didn't have 15 minutes. <laughs> now, anyways, there's what? like a lot of moments where like you'll you'll say these things, and I'm just glad we're already buried because if we weren't, like I don't know if we would be. Oh really? Yeah. Well, I'm sure other, other, news, other people would laugh. We have a very busy I'm week laughing. going on here. I just took Littles to the dentist. Um, I got a root canal yesterday. So there's that. That was uh, not a fun time for me, but whatever. We're, we're over it. Maybe um, that's why you're not really laughing. You're still my upset. Face, my face literally hurts. Um, yeah. In other news. I'm still laughing at my joke. I just got back joke. from Vegas. I had a big Arbonne convention. I'm now an Arbonne consultant. Thank you very much. And I love what I do. And within the next six months, I'll probably earn my Mercedes. And when I do, I'll get a G-Wagon. And then I'll probably be the breadwinner. So there's that. Nothing would make me happier than staying here with the children, teaching them life oh, skills, how here. to be a good contribution to society. The goal for me is to have Vaughn ask me to buy guns. Then I'll be like, oh, no. Hey, what did you spend all this money on at Lowe's? Oh, what did you do there? Oh, the it would be very things. interesting because the, t the tables would then, in I essence, would, they, they would, would really switch because then when she buys makeup, she's like, I'm doing this for the business, God for the family. family. Got to support the family. That's what he always says. Any other news? Um, let's see what else here. We've got a couple appointments this, uh, this week. No one wants to hear this. NRA's next week. Oh, they want to hear that. Yeah. NRA's coming in hot. There's a couple people that are boycotting NRA. Um, however, we're not sensitive. We're not emotional, so we will be going to NRA. Um, Everybody gets upset. I mean, the NRA did say, yeah. They're walking a fine let's, line. Let's settle for some type of gun control, and other people are just like, ah, no, no. And I'm one of those guys that's like, any gun control is a violation of our constitutional rights, but at least they're still the biggest gun advocate uh, business, well, I guess not business, but uh, what would you call them? Not a business, but organization. Organization. There you go. Association. Yeah. That's yeah. what they are. Yeah. Actually, yeah. That's, oh, oh. God, that's why I've got my better half over here. And then we got our largey having goldie fish. Oh, you eat them all. <laughs> Just kidding. But anyway, yes, yeah, so we, we've got a, we've got things going on here. Busy yep, bees. Well, I gotta um, go pick up a hat. Oh. oh. Love ya. Oh, okay. Team meeting over. Wow, wow. All right, out. Toodaloo. Thanks for the chat. Oh, Sue. Bye, Sue. Tat and Baird, they make hats. Chandler is the owner of Tat and Baird, and if I remember correctly, Tatton was the most famous hat maker in Utah at the time, and Baird is uh, actually Chandler's last name. So this is literally a uh, working museum. So they make hats from the uh, 1800s uh, style. So they still use some of the tools, so it's literally a working museum. So that's enough talk for me. I actually want you guys to see what it's all about. Meet Chandler. He actually explains it better. My name is Chandler Baird Scott. We're at Tatton Baird Hatters in Springville, Utah. Um, just a minute here in the shop. We use all the original equipment from the original hat shop that was started in the 18, late 1850s, 1860s here in Utah. Um, you know, the, our equipment hasn't stopped making hats since then, and we've had uh, seven stewards of our equipment that have made hats from it nonstop since then. So um, we're always proud to 
you know, put our hands on equipment that's been used here in Utah specifically and making hats for, for that long a time. What's behind me is, a, is our glory wall. We have another uh, 100, excuse me, 2,000 almost units downstairs, but these are flanges and blocks which help us shape hats. And back in the day, in the turn of the century Victorian era, when the heights were the peak of what they are today, um, uh, every hat was was under three inches. So to have a specific style or a shape and size, you would use a specific set of blocks and flanges to make that. Whether it be a classic fedora, a derby, you know, something like a Homburg that's specific and needs over and under style, then we take one of these 140 year old flanges from the top here and, and specific to our size, we'd use that to shape right here with the sandbagger. Um, one of those hats. Sandbagger flange chains and goes under there and then waits the hat and gets a little bit of shape from there. Um, also here in the showroom we have a bunch of uh, stamping equipment and other things that we put and uh, personalize a hat when we custom make it for someone. Our process is we fit you up, measure your head, talk about what you want to accomplish with your hat, go through the process of picking color, designing that style, whether it be the ribbon, a leather add-on, or some kind of you know personal piece that goes on a custom hat. And then about six, two months later, someone will come back and we'll do that final fitting, make sure the hat fits perfect and exactly what they wanted. And we love to do that with multiple of our customers and build a hat collection so they have a hat for every occasion and kind of start from that most important hat for them and move into something that they wouldn't have used as much or have for, for special occasions. Um, our name comes from John Charles Tatton, who was the first hat man and ran this equipment back in the 1860s and 70s. And obviously the Baird portion, portion is my name, so Tatton Baird Hatters. Okay, so I wanted just to give you a different, have a look over here. I wanted you to have like something different. So I was gonna go, do you like this gust out look? I mean, it's different than anything you have yeah. at this point. Yeah, I do like And then that. I wanted to maybe slouch this like you, like your original stone hat, mm -hmm. colored hat, right? Yeah. So it's kind of just there, but then we don't have any upward yeah. rodeo bins. Yeah. If that's cool, unless no, you wanna go totally no, different I'm, way. I'm totally cool with that. Okay, so yeah. then the next question is, you know, once again, I like the idea of building a collection where you can grow and grab different things for different reasons, but is this seem too big? It's four inches right now. Like the bill? Yeah, yeah the, the brim. Do you want oh. it a little bit? Because if we're going to slouch it and it's kind of just in your in your face, right? Mm -hmm. I can cut some down real, real quick. I left it long just in case you wanted it a length, but... And but we, the thing is, I gotta cut it before we shape yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if if we do cut it, would it be more? Yeah, I'm talking like, like three and a half inches at, at the at the least or at the most. Uh huh. Down that much. Where's my stick? There's a stick right there. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. Typical, like, Vaughn. Campaign hats, scout hats, you know, this uh -huh. kind of flat brim thing is always going to be three inches. You're at four inches right now. Actually, I cut it down already to three and a half. So this is three and a half inches. This is three and a half? Yeah. Okay. So, what do you think? I mean, I <laughs> I love everything you make. It's just, whew, it's just, that's awesome. Do you have anything similar that uh, if you were to cut it short of what it would look like if you were to? Yeah, not really, but we can... Now that I'm, we're talking about it, I did cut it down to the, the three and a half inches. So, I mean, I could go down to three and a quarter, but I wouldn't go less than, okay. than that. Because, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm taking your, you're the guy. I mean, if you're, if you're wanting a small brim hat, let's just make you a small brim hat that's different look and feel. Okay, yeah. Right? Yeah, let's, yeah, let's okay. keep it as is. And... Okay. I'll go, let's go put, put some. Front dip down. Yeah, so he. Yeah, right. just, like, just slouch it all the way around. Don't dip his front too much so he's having to look over the hat or under the hat the whole time. And I was getting, I think we could get a little bit more aggressive too, Cody, with, but let's at least try it out. Yeah, you can get it more front to yeah. back. If I curl the sides up just a little, I can get them pushed down. Okay. But think? unless I do that, then. Oh, it's so sweet. rigid to start with. I love that. But what do you want? You want to do something different with the brim? 
Um, so are you, what, when you talk about different, can you okay, talk we, about going okay. down a little bit more or? Well, see, I'm thinking like a bunch of rainstorms on this brim, the way it is right now, it's going to get to where your stone hat is. Oh, okay. Right? Yep. But then this is a, I mean, this is 100% beaver, so it's the highest quality fur. Mm -hmm. Not to knock your your family member's stone hat, you know, found at the cabin, <laughs> yes, right? Yes, but, yes. But this is, you know, we're we're literally ten times better quality of yeah. fur here. Well, and 100%. so yeah, you know, and when it gets broken in, it's gonna look really good like that. I just thought, then you know, yeah, do it. Yeah. Okay. So let's just yeah, let's let's just do it because just go a little bit more. Because we know the family member's hat that has to retire at some okay. point. Okay. So, so more just, here. Yeah. I just can't like. Yeah. I could go do it. I can do, do it if you want. Yeah. Hey, can, right. can he film that? Of course. Hat making with fine fur is just repetitive heat, steam, and pressure, right? So all we're doing is adding heat, steam, and pressure, and uh, I'm just trying to put a little slouchy shape into it. Okay, so when I just think at this point I can just naturally naturally use this thing. Yeah. And don't you know, don't hold back just like you have on the other hat and it'll go right where you where we want it to. Okay, so anything else you want on there? I mean, I just added the leather for a little bit of detail. Oh, yeah, I love, I yeah. love, and I, I mean, get, I'm all for tucking shit in there. We'll put your liner in it. Cool. Yeah, Cause I, uh, as you know, I, I put these things to work, yeah, man. No, it's good, I like it. Are you gonna be making headdresses too? No. I saw oh, just that picture there. Oh, I, I just sure I, was... I went to an exhibit in New York, um, and they had uh, it was actually all indigenous tribes from the Rocky Mountains to the Midwest or to the you know the plains, the prairies, mm -hmm. and it was all about the beaver. So and porcupine quills. So it was, this was a porcupine quill headdress, and uh, they had a bunch of stuff that were. Majestic beaver kind of uh -huh. worship or you know idolic kind of things and I just thought it was super cool Yeah, I love it So I, I've had this for a number of years. This came out of a hat shop in Tombstone, Arizona. It's a super, super cool piece. You know, anyone that comes to the shop can come and tell you a story about it or, or we can show it off. But it is an original teak hat washing machine because hat making has always been the pinnacle of fashion or the most expensive thing a gentleman has on his body. His boots, his gun, everything, all, you know, his custom made suit in the Victorian era. The most expensive thing was his beaver fur hat. It was still in that equivalent dollar amount, six to seven to eight hundred dollars, you know, back then even. So we never threw things away. We always fixed them and made them better or cleaned them. So this, you would bring this to your, bring your hat to your hat maker. He would throw your beaver fur hat in there and then it would get us washed. You can smell the like turpentine kind of yeah, cleaner can. in there. But then this would sit and rotate for a couple of hours and they would pull the body back out and then essentially just start with a new fur body and make a, a, his hat anew essentially. Wow. But this was a belly washer 
that's probably 110 years old, 120 years old. You know, it was updated with some electrical motor stuff. But, but this was before. Help. Was it just hand yeah. cranked, mm -hmm. or it was a hit and miss run on a belt system too? So they would have a hit and miss motor and run all their equipment. So all the equipment downstairs at our shop even was run by a hit and miss motor with a shaft that went through the building. So the outside was the motor shaft went through the building. That shaft spun, and you'd throw a leather belt up around, just spin everything, uh -huh, and then run that drum. Wow. So like my my. You know, two of my pieces of equipment downstairs did the same thing back in the day that we've just made them, you know, electric motors now. Look at that ingenuity. Somebody's just like, oh, yeah, it still works. So, that's amazing. Pretty cool, huh? How'd you get your hands on it? Uh, someone was going to throw it away. Like another, you know, back in the day, 15 years ago, some guy was like, I got this thing. Do you want it? And I'm like, yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> Fur and beaver fur specifically is just like that. So instead of tanning it like this, we have this on display to teach people or to tell a story about it, but you're never gonna tan the, the beaver hide to then shear the, the hair off. In a green state, when it's you know taken off the animal, the fur is sheared off the hide and then put in those different categories. And on the beaver, you regularly have that belly fur which is down underneath there, and then everything that's shiny and oily on top is called a guard hair. So those are used for different hat making styles, but those are sheared off, then categorized and sold like a commodity. So to this day, beavers are not cage raised as much as people might think. Mm -hmm. Rabbits and mink, those kinds of things are, but the beaver is a 30 pound animal if you feed it healthily. So to put it in a bunch of cages, and, and then they don't just eat like a they, mink does. They live an active lifestyle. They do. They have, you know, they have these these grappling teeth that want to, you know, cut down wood constantly all the time. Mm -hmm. Constantly bite. Constantly go. And, and people don't realize too that that beavers grow teeth their entire lives. Mm -hmm. Kind so of like kind of like rats. So they, they totally always have to be eaten. Yeah. There's another good teaching. Though. So this is a beaver. Well, he's glued in there. But these beaver teeth go all the way up into here and they never stop growing. So as they break them off eating wood, you know, they just kind of grow as they need them. But the point I'm trying to make is trap lines in the wild, beavers are still sourced majority like they were 200 years ago. Oh, wow. Same exact way. And with your hats, is it primarily beaver and rabbit or? Are there any so other are, animals? Are, we usually work in only 100%. That's uh -huh. what we like to do. And believe it or not, when you're buying a hat as expensive they, as they are, mm -hmm. beaver fur is, you know, it's the best thing. It's the cat's meow. It's the best product on the planet. So we usually do the mostly that. But when we do have a blend, our specific blend is called a 20X. It's 60% beaver and the rest is rabbit nutria. R rabbit is, you know, what we know. It's a specific kind of rabbit that has a good fine hair on it that's similar to human hair. And then the nutria is the only animal, um, rodent specifically, that has beaver fur style hair on its body. So that's a rabbit nutria blend. Hmm. And uh, explain this, say, because a lot of people, if they walk into a boot barn, they're like, oh yeah, I saw this cowboy hat that was 5X. Yeah. What is the X? So, so X is a French delineation determining the quality of fur. So mm -hmm. back in the day, 100 years ago, when it was, it was invented, 5X was the lowest on the totem pole. So 5X would have had more rabbit in it than anything else. 15X should be half beaver, half rabbit. 30X technically is 100% rabbit. When we say 100X, that's really just repeating 100%, right? Yeah. But it really is 5X through 30X. And, and as you get closer to that 30X, that's just explaining there's more beaver fur in the hat. That's essentially what it is. So when you see a uh, a straw hat that's five and ten x, I don't know what that means, other than we've always said x is our quality. Yeah. So that must be a quality straw hat. <laughs> <laughs> so. so needless to say, there's no x's here because everything is one hundred percent. Yeah, sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> I mean, how would you describe it as like, uh, you know, when people ask that question, what is your quality? Because do you sell half rabbit, half beaver? We do our blend. Our blend is a 20 X. Yeah. Okay. So, so I really in the shop, I don't have, but a hundred percent. So 30 or a hundred X, 30 X, a hundred X. And then our next 
level of beaver quality is 20x. 60% beaver, the rest rabbit nutria. I don't do anything less than that. Mm -hmm. So okay. 20x's. So Chandler appreciates history, much like me, actually probably more so because I mean he works in a, in a museum pretty much surrounded by nothing but historical items. And a lot of the items we see here are from the Victorian era. But he was telling me about the proper way that a man would uh, eat uh, his tea and the, the things to protect his, his mustache. Absolutely. So, you know, in my opinion, history tells us the the hat specifically comes to, you know, here at the shop. The Victorian era was the height of all of that. You, If you were a wealthy man, you had a hat for all occasions from... Uh, you know, hat you went onto the street, a hat you did cowboy and, and equestrian type of activities in, to a top hat that was a regalia piece that you went to a funeral with, with a mourning band that was four inches tall. Any one of those subjects. The same kind of thing could apply to whatever a man did, whether it would be eating, hunting, whatever it was, right? So I, I don't have them here, but one of the coolest things during the Victoria era was a fruit knife. And no one realizes this anymore, but if you go and look up what a fruit knife is, it's just a single blade, teeny tiny thin thing that you'd always have in your breast coat. And it's not a sharp blade, it's actually dull. And it was made to cut your fresh fruit or your ripe fruit when you were on horseback or you know in your buggy or on you know whatever occasion. So a real gentleman in the Victorian era always had his fruit knife. So if you're dressing up, I mean, to, to be in a specific time period, like a lot of guys do, then mm -hmm. a fruit knife was essential, essentially. The next piece of equipment that if you went to a really classy establishment, a gentleman that was Victorian era, had hats, fruit knives, whatever he did, a specialized custom gun on his, on his belt, he would be given the opportunity to use um, a mustache spoon, a mustache coffee cup. So when you used all this stuff, none of the cream in your sh coffee or your soup spoon, none of this would get onto so your look mustache. Look at that. So that's in essence a mustache guard. guard. Yeah. So you'd have an entire set of silver um, that you know blocked getting squash soup in your mustache. That's the struggle. That is the yes, struggle right. that beards and, and mustaches face today is the mess that comes with it. Yeah. So the Victorian area, they were actually civilized. We're living in a barbarian world where we have to literally put our mustaches in everything we eat. This is civilized. So a lot of people, you know, they're under the impression that Stetson was uh, pretty much the best quality hat you could get. Tell us about Stetson and kind of... Well, Stetson's, you know, it's... From a brand perspective, it's the most powerful thing in hat making, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. um, to this day, it's owned by a conglomerate, so there's uh, Stetson being the highest of that quality, and then there's other brands under it, and that's the American Hat Company that, that has all that. But the Stetson brand has always been a very, very choice hat. They've done everything besides just being a cowboy hat making brand. Back in the day, Victorian era, which we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. they made top hats and derbies and everything you could imagine. The beauty, the, the good story that I like is, you know, Stetson came out, John B. Stetson specifically came out with the, the boss of the plains, pre-Victorian era, or almost, you know, we were a little late in the Rockies or in the West, mm -hmm. um, and in the Western United States to all that, but, but the boss of the plains, which was a, just a 100% customizable hat with a three inch brim, that ruled the world because at that time, the first time in history, uh, Setson had set up a good program of agents that sold his products and, and it was all over the United States or available everywhere. You could essentially go a day's ride by carriage or horseback and have your Stetson or buy a Stetson or have your Stetson worked on, repaired or tuned up. Good. So it's kind of like the equivalent of a, a Chevy or Ford dealership. Absolutely. You're just 100%. like, oh, hey, I'm in this town, but oh, there's a you dealership, go, you yeah. know, 10 miles so up the road. So before you went and chased a little tail at the salon or, or the saloon, excuse me, you would go and have your hat tuned up when you arrived to this new town or whatever. Uh -huh. uh, that was a part of life as a gentleman. Shoes shined, new clothes, a hat. new paper collar, uh -huh. and a tuned up hat. Man, we got to get back to the classics. <laughs>